Hello and welcome to uh, tonight's In Conversation with UK crime fiction author Peter James. Now, my name's Rochelle Jackson and I'm tonight's chair. I'm an investigative journalist and true crime author and have just published my third true crime book, Partners and Crime, with uh, publishers Alan and Unwin. Now, Partners in Crime features interviews with eight women who were partners of some of Australia's most infamous men. Um, crooks and crims. Now, they range from the former girlfriend of Aussie Bob Trimboli, you might have heard of him, right through to uh, Chopper Reed's ex-wife Mary Ann Reed. So um, tonight, just to give you a little bit of an idea of how it's going to go, um, Peter and I will have a discussion and, uh, and a bit of a Q&A, and then I'll open it up to the audience so that you can ask a question. In fact, there'll be people around that'll have microphones so you can ask a question to Peter. And if you'd like to buy copies of our new books, of course, you can do so after tonight's event, and I think Peter and I will be more than happy to sign them for you. Now, I've got to admit, Mia Culpa, I'm not a big fan of crime fiction. I'm a true crime author, Bye. so of course... <laughs> See you later. OK, thanks. So I tend to like things real, realistic, factual, non-fiction. Now, as Peter would know, there's a lot of crime fiction being published throughout the world, and to be honest, a lot of it is pretty darn average. I've done a lot of interviews with a lot of crime fiction authors and read a heck of a lot of crime fiction. And they seem to be quite formulaic. And to be frank, they don't really inspire me to read any more. However, you're waiting for that. In August 2010, I read Peter James' book, Dead Like Us. I was interviewing him on my ABC radio program, crime, The Crime Couch, and I've got to admit this book converted me, converted me totally to crime fiction. Here was a book that I could relate to. I loved the embattled protagonist, Detective Roy Grace. It was well-written, succinct, and a real page-turner. Well, nothing's changed. I've read Peter's new book, which is not dead yet, another book from his fantastic Roy Grace series, and I couldn't put it down. It's an absolute ripper. It's dramatic, thrilling, and it's very beautifully written. If you like your crime fiction realistic, and I certainly do, then I'd recommend this book. It's about Detective Superintendent Roy Grace and an obsessed stalker. There's also quite a number of subplots woven into the narrative about his personal life, and we also get introduced to some rather intriguing characters. Now, I've also just finished um, Peter's uh, perfect People, which is a bit of a step away from his crime fiction. And let me tell you, if you want a book that leaves your head spinning and wanting more information, then I'd recommend this. Um, get a copy and it'll take you on quite an amazing journey. Now, as many of you know, or maybe some of you don't know, Peter James is not just a crime fiction author who's sold 11 million books that's been translated into 33 languages. He's also an established film producer and scriptwriter. Now, one of his films, The Merchant of Venice, starred Al Pacino. In 2009, Peter was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Brighton for his services to literature and the community. Born and brought up in Brighton, England, Peter spends his time between his homes in Notting Hill, London, and on the South Downs near Lewes in Sussex. Peter's in the country at the moment doing a promotional tour, so it's an absolute great pleasure to be speaking with him here tonight, not on radio. Please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to Peter James. OK, welcome to uh, Melbourne, Peter. Um, Thank you. I don't think I, I need to say anything else. So <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, congratulations on Not Dead Yet. As I said, it's just a fantastic read. Um, you often work closely with Sussex Police, don't you, um, to write your books. Now, did you continue this practice with this book? Yes, I did. Um, I spent an average day a week with the police in Sussex, and, and I also spent time with many other police forces around the world. I had the good fortune to meet a 
officer here in Melbourne a few years ago, George Vickers, who um, was immensely kind to me, and I spent some time here when I was writing the fourth Roy Grace novel, Dead Man's Footsteps. Mm -hmm. And with I'm Not Dead Yet, which is on the theme of stalking, I also spent time with the Los Angeles Police Department. And the LAPD have a celebrity stalking team. Right. Because I guess they have more celebrities per square inch than anywhere else on the planet. And I went out there, and, I, and, I, and they call it the Threat Management Unit. <laughs> And I met the chief of this guy called Chief Moore. And he said, you know, Peter, the problem with these A-list folks is that these are high-voltage people who create their own weather. <laughs> what a line. <laughs> now, look, you do work, as you said, regularly with the Sussex police. I know the, pre the police culture fairly well from writing a number of true crime books and dealing with police. How do the police deal with the fact that there's a pretty big possibility they might end up in your next book? They love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, police have egos too. But what a lot of police feel, and the reason I get so much help from them is that I do try really hard to get it right. And a lot of times the police feel that the public view them as basically farting around with their blues and twos on, rushing home to get an early dinner, and nicking motorists, and that's all they do. Mm. And, and, the, and they like the fact that I actually show really what they do. I'm going to give an example of how the police view the public perception. I was in, with the police in London, in the Met, last year, spending a day out, and I was with a sergeant and, a, and a, another officer, and, and the sergeant was limping. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, you've hurt your foot. He said, yeah. I said, it was about eight months ago. Uh, we were driving up quite near here, and we saw three guys with hoods over their faces come running out of a bank. Didn't look too good to us. So you can't accuse the British police of not being smart. <laughs> so, so we leapt out the car and we chased them. And one guy on the right had a machine pistol and he turned around and pointed it at us. And so we hit the deck. And I thought, I'm not having this. So I got up and I shouted, stop, police! <laughs> and I ran after them. And they split three ways. Huh? Rather stupidly, I went after the one with the machine pistol. Oh! He pointed it at me again, then pointed it down at the ground and fired. Bullet bounced off the pavement into my right knee. He said, I was rolling around in the worst effing agony of my life. I was screaming in pain. God knows what I was saying. Two days later, a very smartly dressed elderly lady walked into Islington Police Station and said, I wish to make a complaint about a police officer using foul language. <laughs> The, sergeant, the, the, the station sergeant said, Madam, this, this, this officer was actually shot whilst very bravely chasing three bank robbers. That's all very well. There was no need for him to have used profanities. <laughs> oh, I'd love to know where that, uh, where that complaint ended up in the circular file. Um, as someone who's grown up in a police family, look, I really get and understand Detective Superintendent Roy Grace, who, of course, is... The protagonist in a lot of these, um, in a lot of uh, your books, Peter, he's flawed and he's very authentic. You know, he falls asleep in front of the TV. He's got a hankering for the occasional cigarette. You know, he's up against everything in his personal and professional life. Is he based on a cop that you know? He is very much so. When I, when I was asked by my publishers, Macmillan, to create, if I'd be interested to create a new detective. Two things kind of <clears throat> coincided. One is that, from all my experience of the police, I, you know, I've always read a lot of crime, crime fiction, although I prefer true crime, ah. particularly your books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'm not just saying that. You know, you're, you're kind of a really interesting writer. But the traditional fictional cop is a guy with a broken life, a broken marriage, a drink problem, kind of down on his cups and a chip on his shoulder. That is not how it happens in real life. Homicide cops tend to be very smart, lateral thinking people, mm. because every major crime, every homicide, major rape, is a massive puzzle. Thousands of pieces to be put together. Any cop today in the modern police force or the drink problem is going to be out in 24 hours. Mm. Um, and I wanted to create somebody authentic. And I'd had the good fortune 30 years ago to get burgled 
Didn't seem that way at the time. <laughs> I'd just gotten married, and we got, and I said, actually, really good. Get burgled just now if you got married, because then you've got a really good excuse for all those horrible ornaments you get given <laughs> <laughs> to not be on the mantelpiece. <laughs> And I'd just written my first ever book, which is a really bad spy thriller called Dead Letter Drop. If you ever see it, ignore it. I keep it out of print now. <laughs> but this detective came to the house, and he said, oh, is that you? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, if you ever want any research help, and he gave me his card. Goodness. Uh, my then wife and I got friendly with him and his wife, who was also a detective. And they started inviting us to a boxing fight, barbecue, dinner at their house. And I realized very rapidly that almost all of their friends were also police officers. It's their comfort zone. It's, it's, it's A, it's who they mix with, but also they can talk about, as, as I'm sure you know from your own background, they can talk about some terrible crime without worrying it's going to be in the papers the next day, mm. or some gruesome accident or homicide without people throwing up at the dinner table. And as I got to know more of their officers, and they said, oh, you're a writer, would you like to come and see what we're doing? And they started inviting me out on patrol, and as I got their confidence, slowly I started getting even asked to raids and ultimately to crime scenes. And about 15 years ago, I was introduced to a young homicide detective who was a DI in Brighton called Dave Gaylor. And I remember walking to his office, and it was full, it was a tip. It was full of blue and green plastic crates bulging with manila folders. And I said, are you moving office? And he said, no, these are my dead friends. Oh. I thought, great, I've met the only weirdo in Sussex CID. <laughs> and he then explained, he said, each one of the, he said, I've, although I'm a homicide detective, I've just been put in charge of reopening all the unsolved murders in Sussex. Each one of these crates contains the principal case file of an unsolved murder. Mm -hmm. I am the last chance each of these victims has for justice and that their families have for closure. Mm -hmm. And I love that really human aspect of this man. And then he said, what are you writing? And I was writing a, a thriller called Denial, which had some police activity in it. And he said, tell me the story. I was about halfway through the book. And he said, well, don't you think your detective would have done that? And uh, wouldn't the police officer have done that? And I'm sure they wouldn't have let them in there. Mm. And I thought, this guy's got a really broad bandwidth. And we became friends. And from that point onwards, he would read my books in very early stage and correct anything to do with the police. And by 2001, he'd risen and become detective chief superintendent, Sussex CID, a head of major crime. Mm. And when Macmillan said, would I like to create a fictional detective, I went to Dave Gaylor and I said, how would you like to be a fictional detective? <laughs> and he loved it. And he sits in the shadow. He is my real life Roy Grace. He doesn't have a missing wife. <laughs> um, but there's a lot about him that, that is in Roy. And we've discussed the plots together. And he reads my books every 100 pages mm. and tells me how Roy Grace would think as a real homicide detective would. So it really helps to inform the books. And well, that really shows, uh, I mean, I, if anyone's read, um, and I'm sure I have read your books, it really shows that ring of authenticity. In Not Dead Yet, as in um, Dead Like You, there were so many subplots, um, twists, turns. Uh, how do you weave so complex a tale, Peter? Do you... I mean, I know from my point of view as a true crime author, you're not worried so much about that, but in, you know, because you're writing um, non-fiction. But in your situation, are you, do you have to whiteboard it? I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine how you go about planning it before you start writing. Large vodka martini and a fag really help. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to play chess a lot. Um, and, and when you play chess, you have to kind of think a lot of moves ahead. Mm. So there's kind of a strategy, and I think that kind of helped me. I love, I plot to some extent. I think the, it's really important to plot to an extent. So I plan about the first 20% of a book. I always take a theme that I want to write about in, in Not Dead Yet. Mm -hmm. It was stalking. Sometimes I have a, a true story that I, I use elements of. Um, I mean, in the novel we talked to Dead, Dead Like You, mm -hmm. that originated from, from a true story. I was at a homicide conference in the States, and there was a presentation given on a, a rapist mm -hmm. um, who took people's shoes. Um, extraordinary case, and this guy between 1983 and 1987 mm -hmm. um, raped 126 women um, and took their shoes. And I'd always wanted to write about rape because I like to write about all aspects of the human condition. And homicide um, has a tremendous clear-up rate. It's 93% year-on-year mm -hmm. year throughout most of the Western world. Rape, it's about 2%. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and I, I took a kind of true rate case as a kind of starting point for that. Um, with Not Dead Yet, I basically had three different starting points. Um, one was that I've worked with a lot of A-list celebrities over the years, I mean, including Al Pacino, Sharon Stone, Charlie Theron, and could see the way both they protect themselves with bodyguards, and at the same time, they crave the adulation. Hmm. Um, and I remember some years ago, to, well, at the time when it was a different celebrity, but it's Princess Diana. And two years before she died, you may remember there was a huge amount of press with her and Sarah Ferguson, the royal knockabout, and the Queen got really upset about it and tried to get Fleet Street to calm down. And I met Lord Wakeham, who was head of the Press Complaints Council at the time. And I said, how are you getting on with calming us down? And he said, we had a meeting at Buckingham Palace yesterday with all the Fleet Street editors. Mm -hmm. And I said, the Queen has asked me to ask you to please calm down the coverage. And so David English, who was then editor of the Daily Mail, which is our kind of biggest, uh, kind of most popular broadsheet, said, if I put a piece on Sarah Ferguson, within two hours of the newspaper hitting the stand, I get Princess Diana on the phone in person, mm. saying, you just gave Sarah eight column inches. I only had six yesterday. <laughs> and, 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 and the A-list guys are like that. When I, when I was out in Los Angeles uh, talking to the, 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 the threat management unit, um, <laughs> They said to me that you know, they get someone like um, Britney Spears says she has a stalker, she won't go shopping unless the police are there and they close the store. And then they find she's tweeting saying where she's going to be. Mm. Wow. Because they, they crave this. Mm. Uh, so that was kind of one starting point. And, and then the other starting point was um, I had a stalker myself for, for, for 10 years mm. and just know what it feels like to some extent. And I thought it would be kind of interesting to meld that. And then the third starting point was I met a Madonna obsessive. And because Di Gaia, my central character um, in the novel, she's a movie actress, a rock star turned movie actress, very much inspired by Madonna, who wants to play this role which she thinks is the new King's Speech. And it's playing the, the, the lover of King, King George IV. Mm. And, I, and I met this woman through, through somebody I knew. She lives in the north of England. She's 33 years old, attractive woman, lives with a boyfriend. She works as a legal secretary. For the last 20 years, she has spent every single penny she's earned and inherited on pursuing her obsession with Madonna. She has a shrine upstairs in the house, and I mean shrine, glass display cabinets, mannequins on which there's a dress that Madonna threw in the audience that she paid $15,000 for on eBay. I reckon she spent 500,000 Australian dollars pursuing this. She'll buy a front row seat hmm. to every single day of a concert. And I said, have you ever met Madonna? And she said, well, uh, in, in January this year, I, I bought a ticket to the... Uh, movie premiere of W.E., the film Madonna directed, and I, and I paid 180 pounds to go to the VIP area. And I went there, and it was all jostle, and I suddenly bumped into someone, and I turned around, and it was Madonna. Mm -hmm. I said, what did you say? Oh, I didn't say anything. I was too embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> but Extraordinary. I, but I thought if she, if she had turned to her and Madonna had blanked her, mm. how that could just flip somebody. So and, that's, that's where you start? And that's the key of, that was the key starting point. So then I thought, right, who, who might the characters be hmm. that could have a grudge hmm. against Madonna or against the film production unit? Because the movie business is a scuzzy business. Hmm. It's, you know, it is culturally dishonest. You know, all the major studios steal all the money they can get. And hmm. I'm saying this for somebody who's made 26 movies, you know, I know. Hmm. And, so, and I've got somebody who's been, starting point, you know, Drayton Wheeler, who reckons that his script has been stolen. Hmm. Yeah, no, look, as I said, it's just got that ring of authenticity. Um, as you mentioned, Peter, you've unfortunately been the subject of a stalker in, in the U UK for about the last 10 years with um, a woman who's followed you around and goes to your talks. Um, <clears throat> uh, Hi! Yeah, that's the person up the back there. Uh, you've spoken about it publicly. Like... Obviously, you use this experience in writing your book. How do you write then? You're used to being stalked. How do you then write from a stalker's point of view? I, 
you have to have a certain amount of imagination, but but it, it, it was a really good experience because this 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 was this woman was. I, I don't want to put any of you off from coming to my talks in the future, <laughs> <laughs> but it was about I, I do in England. I do events kind of like this pretty well every, every week all year round, and, and in other countries. And I, about ten years ago, I, I saw this woman in the audience. And I was doing a talk in Glasgow, and she kept smiling at me. I didn't, I didn't know her from Adam. She was kind of in her mid thirties then, and no, oh, didn't see her. She didn't come up to buy a book or anything. That was very mean. <laughs> ah. Could Anyhow, be creepy. Then, I, then I'm doing a talk in Bristol about a, a week later, and I see this face, and I thought, and she's smiling at me again like she knows me, and I think, she looks like that woman in Glasgow. And then I'm in Sheffield, and she's there again. Uh, and everywhere I go during that year, she is there. She never comes up, never says anything. Then I started getting emails like, oh, hi, Peter, I thought you looked really nice in that black T-shirt. Uh, Morning and, and, bells. And, and I like the way you smiled at me. Uh-oh. And then she'd start coming, and, she'd email, and if I replied to the email... I get a reply back within two minutes. And then if I didn't reply, dear Peter, you, you haven't replied for two hours. I'm really worried about you. Are you OK? You're not unconscious anywhere? And, th- and then if she wasn't going to come to a talk, she'd, she'd email us out, I'm really sorry. I'm not going to be able to make the talk in Ipswich. I hope it's going to be OK. And then she started coming up just to have the book signed. Hmm. And at least she's buying them there. At least she's buying them. I got a customer. And the great thing That's was good. she'd come to every event and buy the same book over and over again. <laughs> And then she sent me, after about five years, I got this picture of a shrine. And it was, the, it was a wall oh of gosh. Peter James. Every single book and every, uh, every short story collection I'd contributed a, a, volume, a, a story to with candles burning either side. At which point I, I spoke to my friends and the police and they checked her out and they said, well, she doesn't have a record, but better be careful. And you know, we stepped up security at the house. And, and then... Um, the next thing that happened was uh, about two and a half years ago, I was doing a signing. And when you do signings, if, if you have a lot of people, you get blank to faces. And I don't recognize people. Sometimes it might be a police officer I've only ever seen in uniform and comes up and he's in jeans and a T-shirt. Mm. Anyway, suddenly there was this woman standing in front of me. And she changed her hairstyle. And I said, what name would you like? And she says, mine. <gasps> and I, and I, I realized who it is. My brain goes blank. I can't remember her name. Oh. I said, what, what, uh, how do you spell it? And she storms off, and I get a 10,000-word email. I've been your number one fan for 10 years. I can't believe you didn't remember my name. And I didn't hear from her again for two years. And I think, I'm sorry about losing the sales. But... And, <laughs> and then when Perfect People came out, and we launched it in England last, <coughs> last October, and I, and I was doing a signing um, actually down in Bristol, and suddenly the book slams down on the table. I look up, and it's her, and she says, I've decided to forgive you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness she's buying the books again. Yeah. And then, what, what, I always try to... I'm How just... frightening, though. I mean, I know, even from publishing um, True Crime, I've had a couple of... I've had some instances which have been quite upsetting and some threats. How do you deal with that? I mean, uh, how do you deal with that as an author? It's... Um, uh... I meet people like you, I, I, I meet a lot of criminals, and sometimes they are kind of quite scary. And mm. I think, you know, Graham Greene once said every author has to carry a chip of ice in their heart. Uh, and I think it's true, you just have to sort of, if you're going to write honestly, mm. um, then you've just got to get on with it and, 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 and hope that that, that's, that stalker is not actually Misery Chastain from the Stephen King book <laughs> and isn't going to come and break your legs. Uh, the sledgehammer or in the book uh, hack them off and cauterize them with a blowtorch um, but it, it, it's an uncomfortable feeling I, I, I then did it, you're asking how did I get into the mind of this I, talk, I always work with a lot of psychologists as well, I, every character, in particular villains, I talk to psychologists um, and ask them what, what's behind the mindset and, and I tried to understand the psychology of, of a stalker and as with most things in life it's never one single category. It's not one single mm. category of person who becomes a rapist. Mm. You know, it starts, you get, you get the flasher who becomes a rapist, you get the burglar who becomes a rapist. It's, and it's the same with stalking, but one category is a person who's been bullied at school, or has bullying parents, and they kind of latch on to this role model mm. as somebody they can both hear or worship who is not going to harm them. 
It's um, are there experiences like I know? Uh, and I'd imagine because you're writing crime fiction, there must be experiences that you come across in, in your life where you think, I'm not going to use those in my books. Or is everything up for grabs? I think that in terms of what I, what I want to write, and what, there's, there is a boundary as to what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable. I mean, for me personally, I don't want to write about paedophiles. It's, it's, it's a subject that actually makes me angry. Um, but I think it's a, a turn off of a subject in a sense. Um, so that's one that I just, it's a horrible crime, but it's not something I want to really go down. Um, but in terms of, I'm fascinated in writing about human nature. Um, I mean, what always intrigues me is whenever you get, you get a serial killer apprehended or, or some horrible murder apprehended, and there's the camera, the, the television crew, filming the next door neighbor, and it's a sweet little old lady, and she always says, he was such a nice man, he used to feed my cat. And some of the world, you know, how many of the world's worst serial killers yeah. are such seemingly respectable guys? I mean, the, the worst guy we had in England was... A, quiet, bespectacled, bearded family doctor called Harold Shipman just happened to like killing his patients and killed 300 of them. Um, mm. Ted Bundy in America, you know, mm. who was a really handsome, bright lawyer, worked for the Republican Party, just happened to like raping, dismembering uh, pretty college students. Mm. And We've got Ivan Millett here. And, mm. Yeah, and, and you've got the, you know, the, the guys out in Adelaide with the, mm. in oh, Snowtown. Yes. Snowtown uh, yeah. and, but those were those kind of fairly low life, but often the serial killers cause are the smart guys, and they're smart. Yeah. Because they're smart, they get away with it. Yeah. It's, it's getting away with murder is something I think happens much more than, than we realise. Um, I, Do you think it's, because I know quite a few crims have said, well, if you're going to commit a crime like that, ostensibly what you do is you don't tell anyone. Yeah. Is that, is that what, your experience? Not when you've been, <laughs> not when you've been killing people, but, uh, you know, I don't want to go into that, but... Uh... My mouth is zipped. <laughs> yeah, 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 the classic murder scenario, there's probably, if you like, there's three different kinds of, of scenario, in, in my view, not... Um, not exclusively, but take one scenario is the guy who falls in love with his mistress. And it's much more convenient for him to murder his wife than divorce her. So, you know, he murders her, he puts her under the kitchen floor, he concretes it over. Mm. But at some point, he has to tell someone. So he takes his best friend out and he says, hey, Charlie, I, I killed Doris, but it's all right because I love Helen, isn't it? And he says, actually, it's not all right. And now you've told me I'm an accessory. So either you go to the police or I go. That's kind of one. People can't live with their conscience. Yeah. The other is the, the, the guy who thinks that, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have... I, I started this case in Toronto. Wouldn't it be nice to have sex with a, with a young girl? And he grabs his 10-year-old girl off the street and, and, having planned it for a couple of weeks, has sex with her. And to his amazement, she doesn't enjoy it. And he now realises she can identify him. So he, he has to kill her. He chops her up. He's got to get rid of the body. He's in a panic. And he gets caught because eventually the, he throws it in Lake Ontario and it washes ashore and he gets caught from a carpet fibre. But the, the third type is, is the true psychopath who is smart, who plans it. I mean, take um, a case like Dennis Rader, who I think is one of the nastiest of, 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 of modern time criminals. Dennis Rader self-styled himself, because a lot of these guys have a big ego. Mm. He self-styled himself BTK, which stood for bind, torture, kill. He lived in Wichita, in Kansas, and between 1973 and 1981, he stalked, raped, dismembered 11 women. And he would choose his victim and follow her for a year. Mm. He'd buy a Barbie doll, practice on the Barbie doll, what he was going to do. And the, he stopped, because in fact his first child was born, and the police lost him. Mm. And it wasn't until uh, almost 2000 and he was actually about to start offending again. And the local newspaper, the Wichita Times, wrote a piece saying, whatever happened to BTK? He didn't like the article. So he wrote this furious letter saying, it was me, I can prove it was me, because he got this all wrong. Mm. Uh, and the first body was up in the kid's cot on the top of the stairs. Mm. And the police got the newspaper to get into correspondence with them, and, and he was eventually caught. But the people like that, and this guy was, um, he was a local government compliance officer, church warden, scout leader, mm. married with two 
daughters who adored him. People like that are the ones that get away with it for a long time. It's interesting, isn't it? It's uh, 1% of the prison population are psychopaths, I've been told from the forensic psychologist I work with, and thank goodness it's only 1%. Um, you're a very visual writer, Peter. Um, you describe, in fact, we almost hear the gravel crunching on the driveway, you know, the rain pounding on the roof. And there's a lovely, um, a lovely description in Perfect People at one stage with one of the characters, Naomi uh, Clayson, observing a, a bird tugging at a reluctant worm before she's about to go into a difficult meeting uh, with a psychologist is obviously going to be dragging information out of her in a similar way. Do you think your visual writing style is a product of you making movies? I, I think definitely making films has helped the way I write, and, and television too, because I think we, we actually read probably in a different way to the Victorians. I mean, Charles Dickens was probably the first modern writer in having to write the page turner mm -hmm. because he published his books in a, in, a, in, a, in a fortnightly magazine, so he had to leave each chapter with a, with a cliffhanger. And I think that today, I like to write the way I like to read, and the, I like to read books with short chapters because I'm reading late at night, usually I'm tired. And if I pick up a book and the chapter's 43 pages long, I go, oh, tomorrow. If it's like three pages, I'll read that, and I get to the end, the next chapter is only two pages, I'll read that. And suddenly I'm, it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm still reading. Uh, but I think you know, we've, we've learned to see into cutting of scenes from watching television, from watching movies. And I learned something, this may sound really banal, but yet, some years ago I was working on a television comedy for ABC Television in, 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 in Los Angeles. And I was, the briefing I was given was you have to have a gag every 14 seconds. Now, I don't have a gag in my books every 14 seconds, but it's always stuck with me. And, and the reason they have that is they reckon half the audience on, a, on any channel in America at any given time are channel surfing. Mm. So if you get them with a joke, they'll stay for the next joke, and you, and you keep them hooked that way. Mm. And I don't apply that, the joke thing to my writing, but I do think it's really important to keep grabbing the reader's attention. Do you think there's a, an enormous demand now for audiences in the sense, do you think they've changed? You've written now at least 23 books. Have you noticed the audience as a, I suppose, as, as an entity has changed? Are we more demanding now? Are we, do we have less attention span? I think readers are certainly more demanding. I think make any mistake. You know, I, think, I think readers okay. have got more sophisticated. I think you know, there's, there's so much crime, particularly as you were saying earlier, there's been so mm -hmm. much crime, any, any error you make. And, and I, one thing I've noticed in, in particular, who, people who are demanding are police officers. Um, a, lot, a lot of police officers' wives or their husbands complain that their spouse shouts at the screen at anything that's wrong. And, and a lot of police officers don't read crime fiction, so they get so fed up with the mistakes. And I find I'm in, I'm in that same boat. I mean, one of my bete noires is soccer officers on television. Because um, I reckon that most people who, who don't know must think that all soco officers are gay because they turn up in a crime scene wearing this nice white suit so they don't get dirty. Explain what a soco officer is because yes, we as, don't have them here. Uh, uh, scenes of crime officers. Thank you. Now, when you have a murder, the, the reason that the scene of crime officers are wearing that suit is so they do not contaminate the crime scene with their skin cells, with their hair, with their clothing fibres. And yet, so many crime scenes, frost, um, midsummer murders, mm. even rebus. There you have the soccer officers, and then along comes the senior investigating officer in his, in his Macintosh and his brogues, trampling all over it. And he walks right through. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, it drives me nuts. And you think, can't anybody do that basic research? You know, because the, mm. the reality is that the first person, the first police officer to arrive at a crime scene, his first job is to protect the scene, seals it off with crime scene tape. And in the UK, he is empowered to let nobody through, not even the chief of police, unless he's in protective clothing, and signs the scene log and everything else. And uh, you know, it's a really important part of, of, of modern crime investigation. Well, what about DNA samples that get, you know, solved within an hour? <laughs> you know, on, on a lot of the, uh, yeah. a lot of the other crime. Uh, crime series. A, a lot of detectives complain about what CSI has done because, you know, mm. somebody says, well, why, why is it taking you a week to get the DNA? Is, mm. you, know, you can do it in an hour, surely. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. I interviewed a forensic linguist um, on radio at one stage and, and she was someone who examines voices on answering machines and, 
and, and vocal inflections, and she's very fascinating. Now, I've noticed in um, Not Dead Yet, you've got a detective who's an expert in forensic podiatry. Now, explain to me, what can a, what can a person who's a forensic podiatrist tell us, Peter? Well, I, I always love writing, finding things that are new uh, and that, that, that aren't in common knowledge. And I met this forensic podiatrist called Hayden Kelly, and he's only recently started getting work with the police and results. Basically, he can look at a footprint, and from that footprint, or best if he has a couple of them, he could actually pick out somebody in the crowd from their gate. So it's a, the, the footprint is as identifiable as, as a fingerprint. So he can actually watch CCTV footage of a crowd and say that is a person from the way he's walking. And he's got a very sophisticated computer programming that, that it all feeds into. Mm. And I thought this would be really good to use in this book. <laughs> I find you've written, as I said, 23 books now. Do you still enjoy getting up in the morning and, and writing? I mean, what's a... I know I'm, I'm, you're going to hate this question, but what's a typical writing day for you? I, I, I do. I, I, I feel happiest when I'm actually working on a book. It's almost like I kind of anchored to kind of the world I want to be in. I kind of write the wrong way. My working day is completely back to front because I spent a lot of my career before I wrote full time alternating between making film and television and, and writing novels. And so I made a me time to write which is six till 10 at night. And so my, my working day starts psychologically then. Six o'clock in the evening, I have a massive vodka martini, light up a fag, <laughs> put on music, and I kind of get in the zone. And, and I write till about 10 at night. Then I switch off and I watch rubbish television or occasionally something good. Uh, and I'm a runner, I go running in the morning. Then I read what I wrote the night before. I hope I didn't get too smashed and that it makes sense. <laughs> Uh, and I revise what I wrote the night before and plan when I'm going to write. Then I break in the afternoon and, and walk the dogs or play tennis or do emails. And I do that five, sometimes six days a week. And, and Sunday, I, just, I, I try and break and just catch up with the emails in the morning and, and, and break. Mm -hmm. And that's about seven months of the year when I'm writing the first draft. And I love it. I, I really enjoy... And, I, of course, I intersperse that with... <clears throat> going out with the police and doing my research. Um, and quite often I get to a point in my research where I think, oh, I need to know this, so then I'll kind of break. Um, and I, yeah, I, <clears throat> all kinds of sidebars come out of that. I, I, I remember when I was writing Dead Tomorrow, which was the fifth Roy Grace novel about the world traffic in human organs. And there's a scene in that book <clears throat> when I was writing in which a dredger off the coast of Brighton pulls a teenage body, teenager, off the seabed, and the post-mortem's done, and he's found to be missing all his vital organs. And I contact, I thought, right, I need to know what would then happen. And I spoke to the police dive team, and they said, well, what we would do, oh, they said, come on, come out and see. And so they invited me out on a boat ride, not very smart in the English Channel in February, mm. a force seven gale blowing. <laughs> uh, anyway, they, I was, and I thought up to that point, being a police diver was probably a nice gig. <laughs> It wasn't until I went out with them, I realized it's probably the worst job in the world mm. because they're, when they're diving, they're diving in sewers, mm. canals full of supermarket trolleys and barbed wire. Mm. Um, and the English Channel is so churned up, they don't even bother taking a torch. And we were talking about bodies earlier, and mm. what they do is they drop a shot line down, a weighted line down to the bottom. Mm. Um, if they spotted something, there might be another body. And then a two-man dive team, one stays on the boat, the other goes down with a 200-meter cable with a weight on each end, called a uh, jack stay. And he puts it down, he's in the darkness, remember, pays out 200 meters, and then he walks or swims back, holding the cable with one hand and feeling with the other. And then he finds the body, and he has to hug it. Um, in case it moves, and he speaks to his colleague, who then comes down with a bag and with an airbag. He doesn't try and lift it in case the head comes off or the arm. Now, I hope none of you are having shellfish tonight, Morton Bay, bu <laughs> Morton Bay bugs or anything, because anybody that's been on the floor of the English Channel for more than four days, every single inch of it is going to be covered in whelks, prawns, mm. crabs, and lobster. Yeah. Mm. So it's, 
and they're sitting there in darkness with these things crawling over them. That's why I think it's not a good job. It's not a good job. But when I was out with them, uh, they loved telling me gory stories, and, and, they, and they were telling me the story about a teenager who'd skidded recently, they'd, three years back, skidded off a river, mm-hmm. off a road into an icy river in, in winter. And they said we, you know, he drowned getting out of the car. And we couldn't get his hands off the door frame. He had dead man's grip. Mm. I said, I like that expression. That's going to be the title of my next book. And, and they explained that if, if, if you have rigor mortis, if, if, if you were to kill me right now, it would take 18 to 24 hours for rigor mortis to set in. If I drowned, it could be almost instant. And whatever you're holding on to, you don't let go of. Mm-hmm. So it gave me the title of my next book. Fantastic. Um, tell us... You know, I know at one stage I can remember speaking to you about the likelihood of um, your Detective Roy Grace uh, series becoming a television series. Now, I know how long that can be. You might have done a lot of work in television as a television producer. Um, are you any closer to that uh, coming to fruition? And if so, who is going to be the Detective Roy Grace? Well, the most handsome guy in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am closer in, in that... Basically, I've taken control of it myself. I got, I got, because Roy Grace is really important to me and he's, he's the favorite character I've ever created, I've, I've been very careful. I just know you know how easy it is to screw something up. Mm. And when I first, when the first books came out and I, I was in a lucky posi- position that everybody wanted it, I said I would only do a deal if I could get the rights back if I wasn't happy how it was going. And thank God I did because the BBC, uh, not huge, the BBC had them. And two years on, I get a phone call saying, great news, BBC Scotland want to do the series. I said, OK, but why does BBC Scotland in the north of England want to make a series set in Brighton and, and the southeast? Oh, they've had this great idea that Roy Grace could get transferred to Aberdeen Police. <laughs> I said, Foxtrot Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so no. I'm, now, I'm now developing it myself, and I've hired a writer, and I've put my old producing team together. So we are moving forward on it. Oh, that's good. That's great. Well, look, um, thank you very much. We're now going to open the audience session up, and uh, just wanting to know, now's your chance uh, to ask Peter a question. So don't be shy if we've got the microphone uh, individuals at the ready. So um, don't be shy. Step up to the plate. Has anyone got a question for Peter? Come on, there's got to be one. Yes, straight there. I was wondering if, with all the time you've spent with the police, have you ever returned the favour and helped them solve a crime? I've, I've, I, I get asked a lot, of kind of, from from my kind of views and opinions, um, and I've been in um, situations where I've where I've had to hold on to an arrested villain, um, where I've gotten into a fight situation. In fact, I had I had one, um, but. It, Year and a bit ago, I was um, with a young um, crew, as a young sergeant and a young Indian woman police officer, 10 o'clock at night, um, driving through a really rough area of, of Brighton, what we call a sink estate. And Brighton has a bylaw that, that nobody is allowed to have an open bottle or an open can of alcohol on the streets. And there were 10 youths walking down the street, male, all male, all quite drunk, all holding bottles, and, and the two officers got out to confront them, and I, I got out of the car, and I, was, I wear whatever I'm given when I go out of the police, and I just had a yellow observer jacket on. And I was standing at the back of my notepad, and this confrontation rapidly was turning ugly. They were shouting racial insults at the Indian woman officer. You're not effing taking our effing bottles off us. And I could see it was about to turn into a fight. And they were, the sergeant was radioing for backup. But backup at that time in that location on a Thursday night could take 20 minutes, half an hour. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, what do I do now? Uh, do I run? <laughs> Hit them with your notebook? <laughs> yeah, do I, get, do I yeah. get back in the car? Yeah. I thought, well, all right, the only thing I can possibly do to keep respect is I'll have to join in the fray. So being really brave, I looked for the smallest guy. I decided I'm going to hit him first. <laughs> and, and then one of them says, who the fuck's he? <laughs> And there's this silence, and the sergeant says, he's with the FBI. <laughs> and they all back off. <laughs> nice. Became like pussycats, handed over their bottles and cans. I thought, respect. Oh. <laughs> Sensational. <laughs> Anyone else uh, has got a question? Might get a toughie. <laughs> yes? 
like to ask about the, uh, the role of place in, in, in your novels. Uh, are, there, are there some things that uh, Roy Grace would do or wouldn't do that, say, um, Andy Diel or John Rebus would not do or, or conversely would do simply because of the, the towns and, and cities they're in? It's an interesting question. I do think that crime fiction is, is to a very large extent, um, place is almost as much as one of the characters in the book. I think the setting of the book does define the, the crime. I think somewhere like Los Angeles and James Elroy, where you've got you know, a big gun culture. Um, Edinburgh and Brighton are actually not that dissimilar. Um, we, you know, the, the, I think the big difference between England and, and almost any other country in the world is that police don't carry guns. And as a result, villains tend not to carry guns. We, you know, we're very lucky in a city in England, um, Manchester, parts of London, there is quite a bit of gun crime now. But Edinburgh doesn't have it, and, and Brighton doesn't have it. Um, and we have an increasing knife culture. Um, I, you know, I've known officers confronted at 2 o'clock in the morning by some, somebody wielding a sword or a scimitar or um, stiletto. Um, but I think, I think there's probably more of a difference between English crime um, and the kind of crime that we get, and somewhere like in, in America or even India or even here. Mm. Okay, someone else has got a question? Yes, up the back then. I'm interested to know which crime writers you like reading, apart from your own, of course. <laughs> the, the, a lot of... For me, a lot of the kind of influences have been not so much from p per se crime writers. I mean, the biggest, uh, the first influence on, on, on me was when I was about eight and I read my first Sherlock Holmes story. And I remember Watson saying, Gosh, Holmes, how did you deduce that? And Watson, my dear Watson, Holmes said, My dear Watson, I, I knew we were looking for a man whose bathroom window was on the left hand side of his wash basin. And Watson said, God, How, Holmes? He said, Dear Watson, have you never noticed, he's always better shaved on the left-hand side of his face from the light source. <laughs> and, 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 I, and, and I put that book down, I thought, I want to create a detective one day that's as sharp as that. And then when I was 14, growing up in Brighton, which is, uh, and has always had a kind of historic dark edge to it. I mean, in 1932, Brighton was called the murder capital of Europe and the crime capital of the UK. And it's kind of a sobriquet that's remained. And I read Graham Greene's Brighton Rock. Now, Graham Greene is not a crime writer. Mm. But this novel actually changed my perceptions. Up until that point, I'd been weaned on English crime novels. Uh, and, and there was a, you know, Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers. And there was a kind of tradition that you began with a body in the library. Uh, and the rest of the book was a puzzle to solve it. Graham Greene threw the rule book out the window. You know, the, the central characters in, in Brighton Rock were the villains. Pinky, you know, 17-year-old head of a gang who's a murderer, who's a devout Catholic, worried about eternal damnation. And, and I put that book down. And part of that, I think it's got one of the best opening lines ever, ever written. Hale knew within three hours of arriving in Brighton that they meant to murder him. You kind of have to read on. I just was blown away. And I had avoided writing um, crime fiction for a long time because I felt that to be an English crime writer, you had to stick to those rules and conventions. I thought, you know, you had to have a certain... You had to have all these things in a, in a book. You had to have a country house setting, <laughs> a body in the first chapter in the library, free son of religion, free son of sex, free son of violence. So I did come up with the perfect opening line which encompassed all of these. Fuck me, I've been shot! <laughs> said the vicar's wife. <laughs> As her knickers hit the library floor <laughs> of Ponsonby Towers <laughs> with a crash. I have avoided using it so far. <laughs> okay, someone else got a question? Yes, in the front here. Scariest person you've had in researching one of your books. The question is, who's oh. the scariest person that Peter's met when re researching his books? Um, I've met a couple that have actually really spooked me. One very recently at Easter, I, I went to Marbella in Spain, which is um, it's on an area of Spain known as the, the Costa del Crime. Um, and this guy was a former bare-knuckle fighter um, who... Um, Ha, was involved with, with, with a number of murderers on the run out in, in, 
in Marbella and, and, and there were half a dozen guys in the bar all watching television, all shaven hedge tattoos. And he was very chatty to me and I said, you know, can I take a photo of you? He said, yeah, don't turn the camera around because some of them wouldn't like it very much. Uh, but he made me feel really uncomfortable. But then I met this woman um, last year. I, I, I did a lot of talks in prisons and, I, and I've met and talked to a lot of murderers. There's quite a long list of people who have spooked me one way or another. But there was this woman who I found, it was just a sheer banality. There was, in men's prisons, they tend to segregate. Um, the, the, the prisons are all classified category A which are, and, and B, which are lifers, category C, which are more easier, and category D, which are open prisons. In, in women's prisons, they're just all lumped together. And I was at this prison up in, up in the north of England, which had Rosemary West, yeah. um, wife of one of our most famous serial killers. And at the same time, it had the, the woman called Rosemary Darwin, whose husband had faked, she and her husband had faked their disappearance. Anyhow, in the audience, there was this one woman who was very well spoken, and clearly well educated, was asking me a lot of intelligent questions. And I thought, I wonder what you're here for. And I figured probably she was in because she killed somebody drink driving or something like that. She, uh, anyway, I, went up, I managed to get up to her afterwards. And um, I always sort of break the ice. I say, how long do you have to go? Uh, uh, and see how they reply. <laughs> and she said, eight bloody years. She said, it's bloody not fair. She said, a woman did exactly the same as me in London. She's only got four more years to go. I said, what did you do? She said, well, I poisoned my mother-in-law, the old bag. <laughs> I said, all right. She said, yeah. She said, I, I said, can you, can you tell me a bit more? She said, and, and, and she was just absolutely indignant. She said, well, the bloody woman went into the hospital to die, so I embezzled her bank account, and she bloody came home. <laughs> so I had to poison her. Uh, uh, and then I realized my husband would find out, so I poisoned him too. <laughs> And it was the fact that she was, I asked one of the officers after, I said, did, did this woman really do this? And she said, yeah, the husband was in intensive care for three weeks and he's now permanently brain damaged. Mm. And she was indignant mm. about the length of time she got compared to somebody in London. And, and it was that banality. I, I came away really chilled by this woman. That's a big thing in women's prisons, um, isn't it? Where they compare their sentences. And, and that, that seems to be something that does get them very upset if someone's done less time or more time than men. And yeah. I mean, in your book about the women married to yeah, to, well, to, 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 Tanya to, Herman. To prisoners. Did you yeah. find that? I found that uh, she was a constantly. T I've done uh, interviews with Tanya Herman, who's, of course, the former girlfriend and accomplice of Joe Corp, and she uh, was given nine years for attempting to murder Maria Corp with a, a baggage strap, and she actually strangled her in the garage and then put her in the boot of a car and put, put her, drove her down to the shrine here of remembrance, and she stayed in the, the boot of the car for four days until she was found. Uh -huh. um, and then she died uh, six months later on, after they'd removed life support system. But, I mean, the thing that struck me, it's like what you were saying. Here's a woman who has no criminal record whatsoever, and yet she's attempted to murder another woman. And she struck me as being extraordinarily normal. It just hits you in the face like a wet fish. I mean, she's someone that you could imagine, well, I did have cups of tea with her, and I was endeavouring to peer between, you know, what appeared to me a very normal and very, you know, average persona. But you know that, you know, that was something else. She was constantly comparing her sentence of eight years, which she got for attempted murder, with other people that had been given, women that had been given less time. Hmm. And do you find that when you're going to to the women prisons, you know, you're, you're, you're having to wrangle with the fact that there's a real disconnect sometimes between the people that have done the crime and, and are doing the time and their crimes. Completely. Yeah, I mean, there's, no, there's no kind of standard. Um, and, and, and there is, I mean, it's, also when you say, have I been scared? I mean, it's even just, they sit in groups in England. You'll get mm. all the, the, the black girls sit together and they're all the kind of drug dealers. And then you get the young white girls and they're all the hookers. Mm. And then you get the middle-aged women, and they're all the, the husband murderers. Mm. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and bezelers. Yeah, and they do and then, fraud, don't yeah. they? Yeah. And it's, it's kind of really... I mean, one, one of the scariest places I ever went to was Broadmoor. Um, Broadmoor is Britain's premier in criminal insane asylum. You have to be violently criminally insane. And they have the worst of, 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 of the worst in there. And I remember one time getting taken into his assessment room. And actually, probably this was the most scary moment ever. 
and it was a room. Broadmoor is a really horrible looking place. It's um, half a mile long on the top of a hill, red brick with towers. And I arrived there, and I was taken around by the chaplain. It took me a year to get in, because they tend to only let people doing serious psychological research. And the chaplain had, and everything is like all prisons, is two doors, you unlock a door, go in, lock it. And he had his key on a leather thong. And I said, I'm surprised you don't have it on a chain. He said, well, we used to, sir, but one of the inmates tore one of the offices in half. You know, because you get that kind of strength. And he took me into this assessment room, and it's a prefab building within the compound where prisoners for the first year are put to assess their interpersonal skills. And we go in, and we lock ourselves in this room, and there's, only, there's two officers in there, the chaplain and myself, and about 40 inmates in a room just the side of the area we're perhaps all sitting in. They're sitting around the walls, and there's this girl dressed a bit like you, and she's um, got two knitting needles, and she's going, looking at me, and she's going, click, click, click. And, and, and the guy next to her says, fuck off! And she says, you fuck off! And the warder says, don't mind them, so they don't like each other very much. <laughs> and then there's this guy sitting in a business suit, um, drawing a Christmas card. And he looked up at the chaplain. It was at the beginning of December, so. And, and he said, I've lost my state of grace. And he was drawing this, painting this very pretty angel on this Christmas card. And the chaplain said, it'll come back. And he said, do you think so? And he said, yes, it will. And, and, and all these people, I just could feel this sense. And, 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 and eventually we went outside, back into the courtyard. And I said, the guy in the business suit looked fairly benign. He said, yep, he um, murdered his, he wanted to be a woman, so he murdered his girlfriend, cut off her breasts, and sewed them onto his own chest. Oh. And you're, I just felt in the presence of something mm. that... that mm. It's so skewed. Mm. It, it's fascinating, isn't it? When, when you meet the people themselves, I remember getting letters even from Ivan Milat, and even that was enough to know because underneath he wrote, he would write Ivan Milat. He'd there'd be a line, and he would do a little halo, a little angel with a halo above his head, and underneath that would be the words innocent. And that was enough for me. I can remember even getting the letters just was enough to really spook you, knowing that. You know, he was someone that you're liaising with and dealing with that's done and committed so many murders. Mm. Okay, well, look, um, we've probably got time for one more question, I'd say. Okay. Yes, yes, you, sir. Uh, yeah, Rochelle asked you earlier about how, how you plan your books, um, your individual books, but what about the themes that run across multiple books? I'm thinking, of course, of Grace's missing wife. Did you have that, or do you have that planned out from the right at the beginning of the series and know how that's going to play out across numerous books or does it just evolve with the, uh, with the books as they go? If I, if I tell you too much, I have to kill you. <laughs> but um, that, that came about because about, um, it was about 12 years ago, I, I got invited by the police to go to an open day at the missing persons helpline offices. And this, this answer actually plays out into some of the other things we've talked about. And the missing persons helpline officer had this open day for the police. And we had, it was very interesting. They said that in England, every year, 230,000 people are reported missing to the police. Now, most of them turn up within a few days. They said if they haven't turned up within 30 days, they're gone. Almost always, forever. And there are 11,500 people permanently missing in the UK. And it's the same pro rata of population throughout the West of the world. It's 55,000 in America. It's about 4,000 here in Australia. And you think to yourself, where are they? Um, undoubtedly, some people have run off with a lover. Some have faked the disappearance, like I wrote in Dead Man's Footsteps, to get out of debt. Some have had accidents or committed suicide and never been found. But I think you know, a huge amount are people who have been murdered and, and it's never been discovered under mm. Fred West potting shed in, in vats of acid in Snowtown, wherever. Mm. And the one common denominator is that the people they leave behind have no closure. You know, if somebody dies, you, you see the body, you bury the body, you grieve, you, you move on. If somebody's missing, you can't move on. And I thought in, in creating Roy Grace, you know, what good detectives do is they solve puzzles, that it would be really interesting to give him a puzzle of his own that he could not solve. And that's how the kind of, I evolved the mystery. And I was originally going to solve it. I, I, mean, I always knew what the answer was, and I was going to present it in the second book. But when Dead Simple came out, I had such a huge amount of 
male, fan mail of interest speculating. I thought mm, I could have some fun with this because I think part of the fun of crime fiction is you can tease readers and, and as long as you're fair at, at the end of the day. And, and, and I've, that's why I've kind of kept it going. There is quite a lot of a reveal of in, in Not Dead Yet. Oh, but I, I get these like letters. That? I had a letter from a, from, a, from a guy two weeks ago, an email saying, I'm, I'm in hospital, I'm terminally ill, the doctors say I don't have long. <laughs> Please tell me what happened to Sandy. I'll, I'll take it to the grave. <laughs> and what did you say? I said, you just have to make sure you live longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I'd like to um, thank you all very much and, of course, thank Peter. We'll finish up tonight's session. Now, if you'd like to buy a copy of Peter's or my new book, uh, they're selling up the back there uh, with the bookseller and uh, we're more than happy to sign copies for you. Um, I really want to personally thank the Wheeler Centre for continuing to believe in, and support authors and thank you for being such a fantastically, uh, wonderfully warm audience tonight and taking time in your busy lives to come here this evening. Um, finally, I'd like you to put your hands together and together again to thank uh, our wonderful crime fiction author, Peter James. Thank you.